Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pauline Jones. I'm a professor of political science and the director of the International Institute at the University of Michigan. And I am grateful to be here today to welcome you to the II Roundtable, Coronavirus Global Academic Perspectives. The II Roundtable was developed a few years ago to respond quickly and thoughtfully to current events and crises to provide our community with academic knowledge and perspectives, those that often tend to be lacking in the news media and sometimes among our politicians. I roundtables are also designed to showcase both depth and breadth of expertise right here at the University of Michigan, across our schools and departments. II roundtables have therefore become a key part of how the II fulfills our commitment to public engagement. Today, the II roundtable will be run in a somewhat unusual way. Although we always live stream the II roundtables to ensure broad public access, today we will be live streaming exclusively and we will be observing social distancing best practices. What this means is that only one panelist will be coming to the podium at, at one time. We won't be crowding the podium, but rather having uh, individual uh, speakers come to the podium individually. We will also be accepting questions from our virtual audience via Twitter. You can tag us at hashtag IIRoundtable and at IIMichigan. Thus, we ask for your patience as we transition from panelist to panelist and as we navigate the question and answer portion of the roundtable. We will aim to include most of your questions, but certainly all of those that are pertinent to the discussion at hand. Let me first thank, before I introduce our esteemed moderator, Dr. Kolars, let me first thank a few people who made this event possible. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Professor Laura Rozek at the School of Public Health and our director of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies for bringing this to my attention and for doing all of the legwork with organizing and inviting the speakers today. Let me also thank uh, Marilyn Juguer, who is our administrative assistant uh, and executive uh, assistant at the Inter International Institute and helped us put this panel together, as well as Evan Murphy, who is the program uh, manager for the Digital Islamic Studies Center, and Rachel Brichta, who is our uh, manager of our um, communications team. I also want to thank all the panelists who are here today for being here and for taking time out of not just their busy schedules, but was, it is, is an unprecedented, unprecedented time in our lives. And I think it's impacted all of us, not just in our terms of our scholarship and our academic work, but also our personal lives. It is my pleasure now to introduce our moderator for today's roundtable, Dr. Joseph Kolars. Joe, as he likes to be called, became the first senior associate dean for education and global initiatives at the University of Michigan's medical school on June 1, 2009. He serves as the medical school's lead for the oversight and expansion of its education mission and its global initiatives. In this role, he leads the medical school's efforts to adapt and enhance the full spectrum of medical training, from undergraduate to continuing education to biomedical research education, and to bring it together with global impact. Dr. Kolaros has extensive international experience, including numerous faculty development programs worldwide. In 2010, he was appointed, appointed the inaugural co-director of the Joint Institute for Clinical and Translational Research between the University of Michigan Medical School and Peking University Health Science Center. For more than three years, he lived in Shanghai with his family to establish a new healthcare system that could also serve as a learning site for local physicians. Until mid-2012, Dr. Kolars divided his time between the Mayo Clinic and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he works on education systems that will build human resource capacity to transform health. While at Michigan, he has continued his work on these initiatives on behalf of the Gates Foundation. Based on his vast international exper expertise and long-standing commitment to global education and health, I think Dr. Kolars is an excellent choice to moderate this roundtable. Please join me in thanking him for being here today and serving this role. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Pauline, and uh, good afternoon uh, to the audience. I'm particularly grateful to the International Institute for convening what is really a crucial conversation. Uh, during times like this, I think it's more important than ever to gather and uh, in a good, healthy way, and to share information and to be able to pose questions to, to further our understanding. Um, what we'll be doing is having um, three presentations. We've asked each of the presenters to have just some opening comments limited to about 10 minutes, 
And then what we're going to do is open it up to questions. So we would be grateful for those of you who have questions that come to mind, that you pose them on our feeds, and, uh, and I will be um, presenting them from the podium. Also know that the focus of this conversation is around um, COVID-19 and the implications, especially for those of us who are dealing with the international interface. This is having such an impact on the wider community. Many of us are very tied up in the nitty gritty of operations of our, of, our, of our university and our students and what's going on for us in the health system. And we can go there if directed with questions, but a lot of our, our focus is on uh, the big picture and greater understanding. So I'm going to be calling to um, the podium first. Uh, our first presenter is Dr. Preeti uh, Malani. Uh, Dr. Um, Malani is our chief medical officer for the university. So she's the highest ranking uh, medical health officer. She reports directly to our president, Mark Schlissel. Her background, she's a professor of medicine um, at the University of Michigan, um, and she has deep training and expertise in infectious diseases. In fact, she's the author of three textbooks, multiple publications, one of the most prestigious medical journals, the Journal of the American Medical Association, has chosen her to be one of their co-editors. So she's somebody within the medical community that we all turn to both for knowledge but as well as for, for wisdom. So um, Preeti um, has been asked to just say uh, a few words about what is the biology of, of, of COVID-19? Um, why are we more concerned about this relative to other viral illnesses. What has she seen and heard um, how this is playing out internationally? And most importantly, how do people at leadership, um, kind of at the, the, the top levels of the University of Michigan, how are they trying to make decisions in light of so much uncertainty and so much anxiety? So how is she putting that all together? So um, uh, Preeti, we're looking forward to your insights. Thank you, Joe, and thank you again to the organizers. So it's interesting that COVID-19 has sort of taken over our collective world, and it's something that actually didn't have a name even uh, just a few weeks ago. So if, I don't want to spend too much time on the biology, but just a, a few key key uh, points to, to talk about is that uh, there was an initial case of an unusual pneumonia that was was identified in mid-December in, uh, in Wuhan, China. And then by the end of the month, there was a cluster of patients who had a similar illness, and this was reported to the regional WHO office. And then within a few days, the virologists and scientists really got together, and they were able to, to uh, identify a novel coronavirus. And uh, we all know now that it, is, it has been named um, the, the SARS-CoV-2, or and the illness associated with that is COVID-19. Uh, and Again, the, the genetic sequencing data, it really suggested that there was a single introduction into humans and then sustained human-to-human -human transmission. So like the um, earlier SARS outbreak that, that many are familiar with from uh, 2003, as well as the MERS outbreak that is uh, was from several years later, uh, this was a, a coronavirus and a novel coronavirus in the sense that it had never been seen in, in humans before. And uh, the homology is very close to a bat coronavirus, so 96% or so. And the feeling is that, that probably the intermediate host is a, a scaly anteater, the pangolin. And some of you have seen photos of the pangolin. But you know, those issues aside, really, it's a clinical piece that has been very um, interesting and very scary as it has unfolded. Uh, initially, this was an illness that was described solely in China. And it was really uh, centered in Wuhan, which I, you know, many have heard a lot about that 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 city, and really the uh, the extreme measures that were taken to try to decrease traffic and decrease uh, uh, decrease any social interaction, so in, to to prevent spread. Uh, it has spread really to every corner of the world now. It is no longer um, in in China primarily. In fact, cases in Italy and Korea, Iran, and of course in the United States is seeing um, our numbers increase each day. 
So it is truly a uh, pandemic. It's a worldwide virus. Uh, the clinical piece is, is still not fully clear. And we, we know that uh, there are a portion of people who become very ill. Um, they are young. They are old. Um, they really are, it's not clear that there's any one set of risk factors. And again, the, uh, what we see clinically, the people who might present and to a hospital to seek care might be really just the tip of the iceberg. And we still don't have a good sense of exactly what the denominator is. And there have been a number of really interesting modeling studies that, um, that suggest maybe this is really widespread or maybe it's not quite as widespread. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll know more about that in the coming days and weeks. Um, clinically right now, I, I'd say that a couple big questions is really that full spectrum of disease. And I, I think we do know what the severe uh, infection looks like, uh, but we don't have a good sense of what really mild infection might look like or really completely uh, in, asymptomatic or infection without any symptoms at all, and, and really what role that might play in terms of spread uh, through the community. Uh, the other piece that, that uh, we don't fully understand is really transmissibility, although this is believed to be like other respiratory viruses, other coronaviruses, in that uh, transmission is mostly from people coughing on you, from airborne transmission, the role of the environment is not clear. And the role of people that have minimal symptoms is not clear. And you know, all of us are sort of going from place to place, uh, very concerned about uh, the cleanliness of our environment right now, which is good in terms of uh, disease transmission in general. And how much of a role that plays with um, COVID-19 is yet to be, to be determined. Uh, but with no vaccine and no uh, antivirals that are proven effective, it really does come down to pu public health measures. And I know we're going to hear a lot about that in, in, um, with, from the other speakers. And so really this has become something that has taken over, over the world and uh, has changed life. And, you know, Joe, you had said just a short week ago, it was just, it's hard to believe, it was a week ago, you said to me uh, that everything had changed in China, that you had, uh, of course, you have very deep relationships there from the time you've been there, and that the entire society had changed in such a short period of time. And I feel like within days, we're seeing that change here. You know, just really just within a couple of days, our interactions with other people, uh, even how we're set up in this room has changed. And that is going to be something very interesting in terms of the lingering effects. Um, you asked about sort of leadership and how leadership has handled this. This has been on, on the radar and you know, sort of on the horizon for the last two months, really since things had started to accelerate in mid mid January we started paying attention we started thinking about it um, the first steps we did was really thinking about our students who were in uh, international assignments particularly those in China and as the um, the CDC designation increased to level three we worked on bringing home students uh, we had subsequently did that with with Korea and then Italy and of course now really all of Europe and we've actually unfortunately had to 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 um, suspend for the time being our international education programs for for undergraduate students, which um, you know it has a it has a lot of um, disappointment and downstream effects, but I believe it was the right decision to make. And and clearly, even in the few days since we made that decision, it feels like it was it's each each day is like a year long right now, um, but it feels like it has been more than just a few days. And of course, our students are in the process of coming home if they're not already home. Uh, there have been a number of other issues that have been thought about on campus. Of course, Michigan Medicine has its own set of preparation, and uh, as, a, as an infectious disease clinician there, I've been, been sort of peripherally involved, uh, everything from you know, getting ready for more patients to thinking about canceling elective procedures, and things that we had really only talked about in, in uh, tabletop exercises in the past that are really uh, becoming reality for us. And so we're sort of collectively holding our breath and, and waiting. We still have a lot of issues around testing and how that um, makes it challenging. And just to quickly give you an example, we might have a patient where we're concerned about this illness and we might put them into a special room for isolation and it, it requires uh, a lot of care, it requires a lot of equipment that you've, many of you have heard is shorthanded and it, it still takes us a few days to get test results. So that has been a really difficult issue uh, clinically and it's one that is getting appropriately uh, a lot of attention. You know, on campus, it's been different. You know, the health service has been front and center and really thinking very proactively as students return from spring break. In particular, we've had multiple confirmed cases within the, within the Ann Arbor community, including um, the university community. 
Uh, so thinking about how that looks and protecting the frontline uh, workers, you know, everyone who, from people checking in to people who are um, examining patients, and also thinking about the living situations. The college campus is really like about communal living and it's about community. So everything from residence halls to fraternities, sororities, to just apartments and houses people live in, to the fact that today's St. Patrick's Day, and normally on any other year, you would um, Ann Arbor would look really different than it does today. So uh, that ability to gather and convene has, has been impacted severely. And each day, there have been more and more things that have closed down. And we're, 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 um, although we're still functioning as a campus in terms of the educational mission, it really looks really different. And there's no playbook for this. And so I, I feel like more than anything, there's a sense of unease. Uh, besides the academic arena, the research arena has been really concerning. Um, the number of animals, the number of, um, of cell lines, and of other things that people have spent years cultivating and making sure that there's continuity plans to keep all, all these things going. Um, Travel, so many meetings that have been suspended. Domestic travel is now also suspended, and it's been bit by bit. Um, so, unfortunately, all the other aspects of health and well-being kind of get put aside with this, and this has sort of taken up things. And you know, I I'm really interested to see where we go in the next few weeks, and really whether this becomes um, an exercise in resilience, hopefully, and you know, maybe reconnecting uh, in a way that we haven't had to. Uh, it's a, it's a story that is, is still being told, and uh, I think it really demands all of us to be at our best because it, it is really a time that um, our most vulnerable uh, colleagues, our most vulnerable students, really everyone around us is, is um, things are changing in a way that's, that is not easy. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Preeti, and a special thanks for uh, your leadership during these really challenging times. Uh, I know you're making a lot of decisions to try and keep all of us um, healthy and safe. Um, I'd like to say a few words about our next speaker, uh, Professor Joe Eisenberg from our School of Public Health. Um, he's role modeling for us today. So um, he has deep expertise in epidemiology, but he feels that he's coming down with a little bit of a mild viral illness that is separate. It's not COVID-19, all right? But often, how many of you have come to work or come to school when you're not feeling right? And say, well, I can do it. I can deal with it. Um, those times have changed. Now we're all called upon, if we're not feeling right, stay at home. And we're grateful for uh, uh, Professor Eisenberg, both for his willingness to engage on this panel, but to appropriately step aside and say, let me shake this off and not shake it onto the rest of you. So uh, thank you, Professor uh, Eisenberg. So our next speaker uh, offers a really, again, a unique perspective. Professor Howard Markell is a professor in our history of medicine um, here at the University of Michigan. Such a unique background, trained um, uh, as a pediatrician, but then pursued his scholarship in the history of medicine with a particular focus on epidemics. You know, our National Institutes of Health funds primary research, does a lot to support scholarship here at the University of Michigan. Very uniquely, they funded Professor Markell to do research on past epidemics around pandemics, viral illnesses, not unlike what we're in right now. Some of you may recognize him from the multiple books that he has written. He's also a very popular um, author uh, in, uh, for the New York Times. A uh, recent article some of you may have read about the time to act now with closing schools is now. So um, we're grateful that um, uh, Professor Markell um, can uh, give us some comments about uh, what have we learned from past epidemics um, and how does that translate to what we're encountering now? Are we doing the right things? Are we doing too much? Are we doing too little? So uh, Howard, thank you for joining us and we look forward to your comments. Thank you. Um, it is interesting when you study uh, past epidemics, you're a lot like the Maytag repairman, and uh, 
everyone ignores you until there's some crisis uh, and then you're very busy. Um, I'm purposely keeping my hands in my pocket so I don't uh, touch the microphone. Um, about, it, it was actually a, a July 4th weekend of 2005 and I had already written about two books of, of epidemics uh, in America and was ready to turn to another topic. And I got a call, my assistant said, the Pentagon is on line seven. And I thought that was odd because the Pentagon doesn't call me for anything. And it was a colonel in the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, which uh, uh, advises the Defense Department. Uh, up originally was for issues of radiation, but it became a very good uh, uh, player in infectious diseases, both uh, domestically and internationally. And they wanted to know about uh, a series of escape communities uh, in the 1918-1919 uh, pan influenza pandemic. Now, uh, caveat, influenza is a very different virus than COVID-19, but the 1919 uh, influenza pandemic has always been used as our worst case scenario. Uh, it attacked at least 14 million Americans. It killed probably 600,000 to 750,000 Americans. It probably killed anywhere from 40 to 100 million people worldwide and had a case fatality rate of about 2.5%. In some places, such as India, for example, it was over 10%. Now, uh, Today we're dealing with COVID-19, by the way, which may or may not have a case fatality rate of three to 3.4%. Most of us are hopeful that as more moderate and mild cases come into the, denom the denominator, that that case fatality rate will go down. But nobody wants to take chances. And most of us practice, I know as a pediatrician, I, all, I never had a patient or a parent come back to me and say, I want my money back because you said it's better to be safe than sorry. So that was one of the, that's one of the key key issues we've been dealing with. But we looked at these escape communities that basically shut themselves off. And they were very unique, very small communities that could do so. Uh, a mining town in Gunnison, Colorado that closed its gates literally for four months. Uh, a school for the blind in Pittsburgh. Uh, Bryn Mawr College, Princeton University, but these were really unique and most places can't completely shut themselves to all commerce and, uh, and uh, interactions. Schools were closed too, by the way. Now, what I was more interested in was regular cities because that's where the action was. Every city in the 1918 uh, pandemic did some of these what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions. Isolation and quarantine, school closures, and public gathering bans. That's the menu. There are other things you can give advice, you can tell people to wash their hands, but that's harder to measure. But with those three, if you do one, two, or three of them, you know when the trigger was pulled on and you know when the trigger was pulled off. And we found, uh, actually, uh, the, ta the, 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 the remarkable document we found was a, a U.S. Census report that had 43 cities week by week during the pandemic from September of 18 to April of 19, they had their mortality and morbidity rates for influenza and pneumonia and deaths. And it was one set of data as opposed to using different municipal reports, which would have been apples, oranges, and bananas because of how it may have been collated. And so we looked at those cities, and cities had acted early because you have to act before the virus comes in to your community, circulates and hits an inflection point where you get the standard epi curve where you see a very tall hump and there's just a certain point there where it's the point of no return. It's going to affect a lot of people. So they have to act early. They had to use more than one and school closure was one of the most successful, but it was often used with isolation and quarantine. Why school closure? Well, because children have what's called poor respiratory hygiene. So little children slobber all over each other and they cough and they sneeze. And this was long before the vampire uh, cough. In fact, most of us who are, have a gray hair learned to cough into your hands. That was the proper etiquette, say, as late as the 1960s or 70s. But, and older children, high school children, have poor respiratory hygiene, but for different reasons that I won't go into right now. And uh, <laughs> then the final uh, issue was uh, if they use public gathering, but if they acted early, they layered them, use more than one, and you have to use them for a long time because as soon as you, ra you raise the gate, 
the virus gets in. So that worked. Those cities that did that had much better rates of mortality and morbidity than those that did not. And what was really interesting is that about 20 of those cities acted in a way that they released the triggers very early, and then the cases went down, and they said, hey, the flu is over, and so we can, you know, uh, abandon these. Then the cases went back up, then they pulled the trigger again, and the cases went down. So you saw a double hump curve. And that was neat because each city acted as its own control. When they were on, the cases went down. When they were off, the cases went back up again. So we published that and did a lot more work on school closures and things like that at the U of M Center for the History of Medicine with the CDC. And in fact, when 2009 came, there was a lot of talk about using these very measures that we're using now. And President Obama called a great many of us to meet and to uh, uh, advise him. And Mexico, which was extremely forthcoming, unlike what's going on now, was extremely forthcoming in how many cases they had early on. They did the same menu of options, and you saw a double humped curve again. They only did it for 18 days, however, because by then the case fatality rate was clear that it was about 0.7 or less. It was actually mimicking seasonal flu. So you wouldn't use these, you know, the nuclear option of public health tools for something that was not that deadly. You would only use them for very deadly things. There are also a great many uh, modeling studies and computer studies, and of course Japan has been closing schools for flu almost every season for years. So we had a lot of data, but now we're actually doing it. And we're seeing a great many things from history uh, that are both positive and negative. Positive, communities are resilient. They get together, they will get through this. They have gotten through it in the past, they will get through this too. I'm very confident of that. But we're seeing internecine rivalries between different levels of government, both in the United States and internationally. And we have little fights, you know, calling this a hoax, or this is a democratic thing, or a Republican thing, or what have you. Uh, the fact that the testing was not geared up for capacity, which of course it wasn't. It's a novel virus and these things weren't manufactured and nor could they be pulled off the shelf. But that caused uh, Governor Cuomo to, uh, in New York to uh, chastise the CDC, et cetera, et cetera. These things don't help epidemics, in fact, or pandemics. In fact, they, they harm the care of them. There's been scapegoating and we've seen this in the past as well. Chinese restaurants in America are not being, uh, 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 People are not going to them. Chinatown in San Francisco, where they have tours and such, is dead. People aren't going there. And there have been complaints in Hong Kong where uh, various hair and nail salons have signs, we will not serve mainland Chinese customers. So there's scapegoating going on. And even about China, people are angry a little bit, uh, and, and perhaps rightfully so, about the delay in reporting for almost a month uh, to the world of what was going on uh, in Wuhan. Um, there's also a, a great deal of panic and uncertainty, and that comes with almost every epidemic. What is interesting, I think, today compared to the past is that our predecessors 100 years ago had great exper experience with epidemics. The, before the vaccines for childhood infectious diseases like diphtheria or uh, 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 measles or, or, or smallpox, you would see those almost every year. And everyone knew somebody or their own child who died of one of these things. And you saw polio epidemics well into the 50s. In fact, the last serious polio epidemic was in 1955, just before the Salk vaccine was announced probably about four blocks from here in the Rackham Auditorium that it was safe and effective and potent. There were actual polio victims who missed it by a few months by being vaccinated. And that caused a great deal of scary, scared uh, 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 panic, I should say, because uh, it, it affected the children primarily, and parents, understandably, were very nervous for their children. The point I'm making is that while we have not had a great deal of experience with epidemics, or in this case, pandemics, uh, there's never been a better time in human history to battle a pandemic than today except for tomorrow, in that uh, we have such an incredible armamentarium uh, of public health, 
of medical treatments, of, of intensive care, of respirator care, and on and on to combat this. And in fact, it is remarkable that this coronavirus was identified in world's record time, a matter of days, and within a matter of hours when the Chinese uh, public health authorities gave these samples to the NIH authorities, they figured out exactly what piece, what protein of the uh, virus that would be best used for a vaccine in a matter of hours. That's utterly incredible. Uh, so there's a lot of good news uh, with all the bad news. It is weird out there. I mean, I, w I had no trouble parking, for example. That's a first for me in 30 years <laughs> at the University of Michigan. But I think I'd like to end on a positive note in that uh, this is a crisis. We need to take it seriously, particularly for those who are elderly or who have pre-existing serious health conditions. Lots of people are walking around with diseases that they would never be alive 50 years ago because of modern medicine. People with cancer, people with HIV, people with transplants, and on and on that are vulnerable. Those are our people, our, our Americans, who we need to protect most. But I'm very confident that we will get through this. We're a resilient society. And I will close at that. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Howard. Um, really uh, helpful insights. We already have some questions coming in for Howard, for Preeti. So uh, we'll be bringing you back uh, in just a few moments. Um, we are here in the International Institute. Howard acknowledged um, some of the, the international dimensions. We know diseases express themselves in different populations, in different countries, and in, in different ways. Um, we also know that there are different cultural and governmental responses. So we're very fortunate to hear um, from somebody who has a, a particularly rich China perspective where uh, COVID-19 seemed to become recognizable. Uh, Dr. Amy Huang um, uh, grew up in China, studied in China, trained in cardiology in China, uh, specifically in Beijing. We were re uh, fortunate to recruit her here uh, to the University of Michigan where she advanced her training both in, in research and in public health. She leads our Asia programs for global reach um, in the medical school. Global Reach is our Research, Education, and Collaboration for Health uh, unit. Uh, she's a faculty member in our Department of Cardiology. And um, what we've asked um, uh, uh, Dr. Huang to speak to is some of her observations from her friends, her family in China, um, the information that she's seen. They're coming out of this pandemic that we're heading into. And what are some of the lessons or the observations that uh, she's been in touch with? And she's gonna be sharing some of her insights on that and then again, be available for your questions. So um, Professor Wong, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joe. It's a, a great honor to join this round table this afternoon about COVID-19. Um, so since late January, I've been communicating daily with my family, friends, colleagues back in China So I worry about their health. And uh, I know how struggled they are um, facing this unprecedented um, uh, coronavirus. And they have to keep them uh, self-help, and they have to help others who are in need. So China initial outbreak uh, and the lesson we can learn from it really can help us to inform us what we should or could do in the United States right now. So I first heard about the coronavirus outbreak really from the Chinese social media. It's about like a SARS-like um, virus outbreak in Wuhan city. And on June, uh, January 20th, when the uh, Dr. Zhong Nanshan, um, a national uh, respiratory infectious disease expertise in China, announced confirming that this virus is capable of human-to-human -human transmission. So since then, I really, really follow up very closely on the daily news and, and calling to my friends, colleagues uh, working in the front line. So soon after learning about the virus transmission method, uh, as um, the other panelists mentioned about, you know, um, entire Wuhan city is shut down. And uh, we after uh, entire Hubei province with 50 million uh, population shut down. And a week after, entire China was under lockdown. So it's a dramatic change. Uh, the coronavirus has really changed the normal life of every citizen in China. 
And it also is happening at worst, uh, one of the worst uh, timing because it's the Chinese New Year season. Chinese people heading home from all over the China. And last year is um, the uh, it's a break up like uh, three billion trips during this travel season. So you can imagine a lot of mobile um, migration is happening during that uh, break breakout um, season. And uh, um, I know that a lot of people's life was impacted, especially those in Wuhan. Um, by the time the lockdown was declared, the uh, community transmission already happened for weeks. Uh, the spear of the uh, case of the patient crashed the entire hospital system in Wuhan, exhausted um, the frontline um, medical staffs, and resulting a lot of uh, infections um, to the uh, frontline uh, medical staff workers. And the worst scenario is many hospitals, because of the uh, overwhelming hospital uh, capacity, uh, a lot of patients were sent home, and that's worsening the continuous spreading. So after lockdown, the government, um, Chinese government, you can criticize many things, but uh, we can see how rapidly they react. Um, um, they, so far, they deployed over 23,000 medical staff across China to Wuhan, um, and uh, that really, helped Wuhan to uh, fight this um, virus. And there's a lot of, um, I know there's a huge um, uh, quarantine, you know, uh, you heard from the news that they built a hospital in, a, in weeks and uh, they set up huge um, quarantine facilities to um, uh, fight this pandemic. However, life uh, already been lost and uh, those stuck in Wuhan are still suffering. So the Wuhan lockdown um, had reduced many case spreading all over China, but also more important, but very valuable time for other areas in China to prepare and respond. Some of the medical staff uh, dispatched to uh, Wuhan are my colleagues working in Peking University Health Science Center, and also some of it are actually from my medical school colleagues. So they voluntarily to go to Wuhan to help. And their home institution really prepared them well. They um, almost provided um, very enough um, uh, personal protection equipment, medical equipment, and device may need it to bring with them. And they all not only um, kind of um, um, prepare them before they uh, travel to Han, they go through very extensive training in terms of from how to use the uh, PPE to prepare them themselves and to um, the current available uh, clinical guideline to treat the patients. So they are very prepared. So they not only brought the expertise to Wuhan, they also did very heavy lifting for treat patients, save, saving lives, and from further infection to, among the medical workers. So um, with the help across all over the China, so Wuhan city is really uh, right now we can see they are uh, almost uh, toward the end of the uh, transmission. We can see single digit uh, confirmed cases um, in China. And I'm also very glad to see that none of the um, detached medical staff are infected. So beyond that, I also want to share that uh, how the um, outbreak impact, impact Chinese people's life outside Wuhan city. Um, so in early January that this of raising fears of the outbreak uh, really forced other parts of China to ramp up the strong measures to block the uh, spread of the virus. For example, my parents are typical snowbirds uh, who will spend their uh, winter in uh, Sanya. We often refer uh, as Miami in China because mm -hmm. the warm climate. Um, so they stay in a vacation resort uh, with about 800 apartment, most senior with family far away. And their community um, plays strong measures on social distance. For example, everyone has to wear masks uh, when they outside their apartment uh, to keep six feet apart from each other all the time. Uh, limit themselves to two trips per week per family for grocery store shopping. And they, when they come back, they have to measure their temperature before entrance in the uh, community. And only residents will be allowed coming into the resort. Of course, my parents have to change their um, normal routine. They have to stop swimming in the resort swimming pool, uh, uh, play mahjong poker with their friends. However, that's manageable. The most thing um, uh, really 
put the anxiety and nervous level um, through the roof is um, they don't have masks, so they are required to wear masks, but there's shortage um, of the mask, the shortage of the um, grocery um, a variety in the grocery store, and also the more important the lack of uh, transport, um, trans um, prescription uh, medicines. So something that amazed me the most is how rapidly the local community uh, across the country respond to this outbreak. It didn't take long for the local community to form so-called virtual community support network. They utilize um, mobile phones and the WeChat maybe the one of the most dominant social, me, uh, social um, media um, in China. Unlike the United States, we have a variety of uh, social streams, information streams. Uh, so the local virtual community use this network to uh, communicate, to uh, make announcement, even publish um, any new cases close by so that um, they can, uh, with in, um, potential exposure, kind of locations and times so that each of the residents in the community can self-identify themselves. So they can, they, will, they can do self-monitoring uh, monitoring and self-quarantine. All the data will be feed up to the local CDC um, um, equivalent um, uh, officials uh, in China. And e-commerce also plays a huge important role in this outbreak. So people, my parents don't even know how to do online shopping before this outbreak, now they love it. So they can, they use it to uh, keep up their daily supplies. Um, my sister also played a lot of other, on behalf of, uh, you know, send all the goodies from, <laughs> from far away to their local um, uh, community. Um, my sister are in Shanghai and they, they are with um, teenage in middle schools. I heard that two weeks ago they start online learning and they are using very robust online learning to provide by Alibaba called the Ding Ding. And the funny news that the Ding Ding app uh, was rating so low because the student hit it. <laughs> um, they are very robust. They can teach all the curriculum in from math, language art to PE, uh, music, you name it. So compared to those who are in Wuhan, I know my parents and my sister really have uh, some, they, they have changed their daily life, but the challenge and difficulty is really um, man manageable. So we really, um, like looking right now, we are facing really want to be somewhere um, outside of Wuhan, like other part of China um, dealing with. Um, and there are some handful lessons I can want to share, um, maybe we should or could do in the United States. Um, I, I know a lot of expertise uh, emphasize testing, testing, testing. Um, I think in China, the uh, rapid, um, rapid um, uh, and accurate testing is really the key to identify and detect potential uh, cases and uh, do the quarantine. So that it, you know, it really um, plays huge. I, we cannot overemphasize the importance to um, uh, block the further um, spreading. Uh, we also, um, I don't know if there uh, any way we can set up the uh, like a virtual community supporting network. I can think of the United States. In China, there's each community, they already have this kind of local um, uh, arm uh, in place. But in the United States, we have church, we have public school, we have community that uh, we can connect it each other. Those can be um, used as a communication announcement any kind of um, um, severe case identify or exposure, uh, potential ex exposure can be communicated in the local so that they can watch themselves. Another thing I think, um, um, like the Harvard mentioned, uh, social distancing uh, uh, significantly measured in China. Um, in community, in schools, in local business. It's a play, I think, other than the shutdown in entire Hubei, um, Wuhan uh, city, Hubei province, this kind of community social um, distancing is uh, really played a significant role uh, from the further spreading. And last not least, the fact um, uh, we must uh, fact check to avoid false rumors um, that could increase the chaos and anxiety, panic even. So um, I heard a lot of news, you know, like from Twitter, Facebook, you name it, but there's not uh, all the um, uh, information are uh, fact checked. So we have to have a mechanism to really feed the audience, feed the community the correct, accurate news. 
Um, at present, many of, many of our uh, colleagues working frontline to keep us safe. I think I want to emphasize um, we have to do our part to keep social distancing, to help those in our community who are in need. Together we can slow the outbreak, really flatten the curve. It is very um, popular uh, tweet, um, phrase, flatten the curve, so that our health system is not overwhelmed. We can pass this. Thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you, Amy, that was terrific, and I know we're gonna have uh, some um, questions about that. What I'd like to do now is um, pose a couple of questions um, to, to each of our speakers that have come up um, um, from, from audience input. Um, and I'm first gonna start with, uh, with um, uh, Professor Maloney. Um, 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 and uh, there's three questions, and I'm actually gonna lay them out right here. Because if uh, she's at all like me, I, I often forget the questions after I dive into the first one. But let me know, um, l let me tell you what these questions are. Um, first of all, um, is our own university hospital, um, why don't they just prepare their own test? Um, you know, testing seems to be such a, a, a problem. We've got a lot of researchers. Why, why don't we just prepare our own test and go out there and do it? Um, um, a second question is, um, if, if COVID-19, if it came from bats, then why do we believe the source was the pangolin? Any insights there? Um, and um, then the third, um, that many have compared this pandemic to SARS. Is that a reasonable comparison? Um, why didn't <laughs> SARS unfold like we seem to be seeing uh, COVID-19 uh, unfold? So uh, I'll uh, leave these to you, Preeti, uh, to opine on. Great. So thanks for the three easy answers, here, easy questions. <laughs> So uh, the university hospital, in, in terms of the testing issue, so this is ongoing, and actually the, the health system hopefully will have uh, testing on, up and going in maybe two to three weeks. It is a, a complicated issue in terms of, of, of making a test and creating a test and getting geared up and um, making sure that the test is accurate, which of course is important. I will say our colleagues in Seattle, at the University of Washington, they have done a remarkable job in terms of getting testing up. And in fact, I think they're, they're doing testing for other people now. And some of the commercial labs, LabCorp and Quest and others are now offering testing too. So it does create problems in terms of turnaround time. And I think the, the eventually we will have our own testing on site and probably can serve uh, at least the regional area. And that is a work in progress, but uh, it, it, it cannot happen too soon. Uh, because we're still limited in terms of who who can be tested, since these are these are quite precious. Uh, the the comment around the um, the virology, uh, if the COVID nineteen strain is similar to the strain in bats, why is it believed that the source was the pangolin? So this is my sort of simple answer to this as well. There's an intermediate host. So actually, if you look at the other two novel coronaviruses, the SARS original SARS, and then the um, MERS, the Middle Eastern one. They, um, they also had an intermediate host. Um, the, the earlier SARS outbreak, it was, a, it was like a civet cat, and I think it was a, it was a dromary camel for, for MERS. And this one is, you know, this is, is not totally confirmed, but that it, from bat to an intermediate host, um, and it's this kind of this little scaly anteater, which is a, apparently it's a sort of a trafficked animal. Um, but there's sort of more to come on that. It took a while to figure it out with, uh, with SARS, but I think this time um, it, it, it happened sooner, and it is an intermediate uh, host. There's, there's some great stuff to read on that, and maybe later on I can, I can tweet a couple sources. Uh, so the comparison to SARS is really interesting, and people uh, talk a lot about that outbreak, and it was, it was in uh, 2003. And we fortunately did not see it here, but we saw it close by in Canada. And uh, there were actually a number of cases there. There were a number of our colleagues who, who became sick and became exposed. Uh, and the comparisons are, it's a whole scale of difference in terms of the number of cases. Um, but it was also the approach. It wasn't that SARS just sort of disappeared when it got warm. People talk about that. Uh, but it really was a 
seeking out cases, doing aggressive quarantine, uh, contacts, and, and really like the basics of public health and infection prevention. Uh, and, and that's really why SARS didn't become a pandemic. And I, I'd be interested in, in, in Howard's comments on this, but it's not that it couldn't have become, it, it's that there was a very uh, aggressive um, search and destroy strategy, if you will. Um, there, there is um, a sense that SARS had a, a higher uh, morbidity, mortality rate, but again, it's very hard to know what 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 you saw. Um, you could you can make a, you know when you have a a small sample of just two, it's it's hard to to really make uh, big generalizations. But in something that makes people sicker, it's easier to also identify the cases. And in this case, we're as we're learning more about the range of of what happens clinically with COVID infection, it may be that there's a lot of mild infection and it's it's um, all over the place. Uh, I don't believe that that was the case with SARS from everything that we know. So it was perhaps easier to identify the cases and when it became apparent, there was a very, very aggressive uh, approach to trying to, um, to mitigate the cases. Thank you and I'll, um, I'll ask, um, uh, invite Howard to, to respond to any of those questions. But there's two things I'd also ask that um, uh, 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 Professor Markell um, address. One is just an aspect around terminology. It's come up a couple times, the term flattening the curve. Could you explain that to us? What does that actually mean um, so that we, we understand that concept? And the other thing that we'd ask you to comment on is what do we know about the role of anxiety maybe panic from past epidemics. Um, that's come up a couple times in these discussions. And I have to tell you from being in the hospital uh, 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 today, um, there's so much anxiety. There's so much anxiety in our system. Um, I don't know if many of you have had that concept where you're going, maybe I don't have enough toilet paper. You know, you all of a sudden hear that there are shortages and you say, yeah, boy, I better go and get my, um, about my, my share. But there's a lot of anxiety that breeds anxiety that probably really detracts from our well-being. What do we know about that from past, um, past uh, um, uh, pandemics? Is there anything we could or should be doing to address that more explicitly. So a lot on your plate, uh, Howard, but I uh, we'll look forward to your uh, comments. Um, first about the pangolin, which is the, the most trafficked mammal in the world. Its scales are very favored and uh, as medicinal things. And uh, it's not surprising that it's an intermediate host because it's an anteater. And bats consume their weight in insects every day. And it's from all these insects and ants that a lot of viruses are transferred to different species. And then you get this mixing bowl when you have different species trafficking in, in scales or eating animals or things like that. So it, it makes a great deal of sense. In, in terms of mirrors with the dromedary camel, uh, and it emerged in Saudi Arabia where the camel is used uh, as a means of transportation and hauling goods, particularly among Bedouin people. So, uh, and there's very close contact with the people who use the camels uh, with the camels themselves. So, um, you know, we're mixing with species more and more that we've never done before, uh, whether we're consuming them, uh, owning them, uh, or living near them. And uh, that's why these zoonotic infections that go from one species to another seem to be such a problem, I think, today. Um, where, would you describe the term Nazi flattening the curve? Yes, because that came up uh, about 15 years ago when I was sitting in the office of Martin Citron, uh, who's a, a longtime collaborator of mine and uh, the uh, uh, head of the Division of uh, Quarantine and Global Migration at CDC. And we were actually planning this flu study that I just mentioned. And so we were talking about the common, you know, the epi curve that goes up, well, it should go up and then go down by natural means. And we were thinking of these social distancing strategies, these non-pharmaceutical interventions, because that was the lane we were assigned right when bird flu hit. And 
if you recall bird flu, that was 2005, and it was right after Hurricane Katrina. And the George W. Bush administration was frankly nervous about getting caught with another crisis. And so they redoubled their efforts in terms of bird flu. And there was a lot of experts in the government still in the Bush administration who had been doing a lot of work with bioterrorism right after 9-11. And some of the lessons of bioterrorism, of man-made infectious threats, were actually applied to naturally occurring threats. And a lot of us got together. We all had very different mindsets, all had very different backgrounds. But the idea of what could you do viral, uh, uh, vaccine-wise, antiviral, and then the non-pharmaceuticals, and that's what we were assigned. So where does that come from? So the thought that if you could take that epi curve and flatten it, instead of like that, over a course of several days, flatten it so it went over many, 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 many more days. If you flatten that curve and made it longer, hopefully you would get fewer deaths and cases, but even if you didn't, you would have fewer people swamping the hospital. And so pretty spoke about the, the, the capacity. Well, if everybody goes to the hospital at the same time with a cough or cold or actual COVID, what about the regular people who go to the hospital with heart attacks and diabetes and what have you? Because that's what hospitals take care of. And most hospitals that are in the black have a very high census rate already. That's how they operate at 90 to 95 percent capacity because if their beds are empty, they lose money and they go out of business. So they're already at capacity and the ERs are busy and the urgent cares are busy with regular people who get sick. And then you add all the others, the capacity will soon be overflowing and we'll have chaos. So that was another big reason about flattening the curve. And then finally, hopefully, as I was saying, we hoped to uh, eliminate uh, uh, deaths and cases. Now you had one other question for me and I already forgot it. Anxiety. Ah, that made me anxious that I forgot it. <laughs> well, people are always anxious. I think now we live uh, in a particularly neurotic age. <laughs> and, uh, um, and people are especially neurotic and crazy, and, and not crazy, but anxious about things because we all read about it. Now, there's always been media covering epidemics and pandemics since there's been a printing press. And I spent years of my life looking at old newspapers that had full editions, just like today's New York Times, the full edition would be on that particular epidemic and various stories about people who were sent away to quarantine or what have you. But there's a lot more now that's amplified and the, and the volume is much higher because now the quarantined often bring their iPhones or or a computer into the quarantine themselves. So they actually have a voice. If you remember, um, uh, the nurse Hickox, uh, Casey Hickox, uh, during the Ebola crisis when Governor Christie inappropriately uh, quarantined her. She had her laptop, she wrote an op-ed, it, it appeared in the Dallas Morning News, and no pun intended, it went viral. But the people I studied 100 years ago, they're put far away on a quarantine island and you never hear from them again. So we now have in the paper, social media, Twitter, what have you, these voices of the quarantine, which I think is remarkable. But we also have all the rumors that always happen and all the silly stories or conspiracy theories too that were often in the papers 100 or more years ago, but now they are amplified. And that can be a real problem and cause more anxiety. And then there's just the act of being quarantined, whether it's mandatory or voluntary. Uh, we all go a little stir crazy. Now, if you said to somebody, I'm gonna give you a week off, you can hang out, take walks, we'd all say that sounds great. But now we say, well, I'm gonna give you that week off, but you have to stay home and you can't go to Costco and you can't do that. Then, you know, after a day or so, I found myself, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about quarantine for 30 years. I found myself today going a little bit nuts because I couldn't, I didn't wanna go out. And so it does play on your mind. And one of the very important things we do today that we didn't do 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago, but 100 years ago when we put people away in quarantine, we had no treatment for them, we had no care for them because it was simply to keep them far away from us. 
We were healthy, they were not. It was a separation. And they didn't have treatments anyway back then to do anything. Today, we have good care for the isolated. If the quarantine become ill, we, we take care of them very quickly. And if you looked at the quarantines of the people who were evacuated from China, the Americans who were evacuated to the uh, West Coast uh, military base, that was run by Dr. Citron at the CDC. And they, were, they weren't like hotel rooms at the Ritz, but they were decent rooms. They had connectivity. They could talk to people. They had computers. They even had Zumba classes, I was told, that were on TV. They had good food, but they also had psychological care and counseling if it was needed. And that's really important. So the role of psychologists, of social workers, good friends, families, just to connect and talk, whether it's by phone or in person, I think is critical. And uh, it helps put a, a balm on the loneliness. And, and that's important, because we're all people and we're all social beings. So social distancing is really contrary to how we're socialized, <laughs> to use that word over and over again. So. Um, thank you, Howard. And for those of you who may be uh, joining us, it's a little bit of a different uh, panel discussion in that we're all maintaining social distancing, which is also making it a little bit difficult for us to talk with each other. So as I, as I call people to the podium with some specific questions from the audience, I, I also want to open it up to our panelists if they have questions for, uh, for each other that we can generate some dialogue. But now I have a couple of questions for, for, for Amy Huang. Um, the first one, um, you made some references about what was going on in China that Wuhan shut down, city shut down. What does that mean? Are we shut down right now? Is this, are we shut down in Ann Arbor? You know, the, the governor has uh, issued some rules um, and um, so we're on operating under really reduced functionality. Is this the kind of shutdown that took place in Wuhan or something different? Because obviously we'd be very attracted to getting to the kind of numbers that China is looking at right now. So that's the first question. But also if you could speculate, how is it that China was able to respond so quickly? You made references to suddenly building a hospital, you know, a, a thousand bed hospital um, in, in days. Um, uh, and how is it, from your observation, maybe with we, how, why are we struggling with that kind of response rate um, that China seems to be able to have embraced? So looking forward to your comments. So for the first question, the, uh, it's the same shutdown we are facing in Arab right now compared to um, the city lockdown in Wuhan is not. <laughs> so there's a, a much more strong measures place uh, in place in Wuhan and the rest of actually the uh, all over China. So like I mentioned, um, outside Wuhan, I have a direct uh, information from my sisters, my families. So like I said, their community Basically, there's no outside traveler allowed in, uh, and they uh, go out, there are measures. They only allow two trips per week per family for grocery shopping. So that's, a, that's the uh, strong measure. So even in the community, they have to wear masks. If you don't wear masks, they will send you back to home. You, cannot, you are not allowed to come to outside to walk. Um, and also, um, the um, what I heard from my, my, um, my families is um, they also um, have a strong tracking system. They, so the, um, um, the database available, uh, you all heard about the, you know, the, um, a lot of, not a per, um, there's not much privacy uh, in China. There's um, a lot of data you know, collected by the government. They can trace back from individual where they traveled. Uh, which even which train or which airplane they, they take they took in the past few few days, and they if the uh, suddenly they found this patient was positive, they will send uh, um, the patient the patient real name and where they uh, traveled, where was the timing, so that allow all the community watch out um, in the self in, do the self identification and monitoring and the quarantine. So that's how strong measured uh, in outside China, outside Wuhan. Within Wuhan, there's a lot of rumors. Um, I, um, I'm not sure which is true or not, you know, in addition to 
what measures place, uh, in, placed in place um, uh, outside Wuhan, I heard that there's uh, much more strong measures um, uh, placed within the Wuhan city. So why uh, has China able to respond so quickly? Well, I'm not sure that that's uh, uh, actually uh, the fact because uh, initial um, case happened in May, December. So until um, January 31st, the city was locked down. It's already a month, a couple of weeks lost. So during those couple of weeks, that this kind of uh, cultivating time, um, that's what happened, the tragedy happened in Wuhan. Uh, but after the lockdown, I think the government realized how severe uh, the virus is and uh, how, um, and they have to act quickly. And uh, you all know China is, uh, compared to the United States, a very different system. They are very top down. Um, so if the government or the uh, top leader realize and they can um, collect all the resources uh, across uh, China to help Wuhan, so that's why you, you see the hospital have been built within weeks, and uh, uh, they occupy the huge facility for the quarantines. And in China, it's a mandatory quarantine. So you have the positive, uh, the uh, COVID-19, you have to check in those quarantine facility to be monitored and to be taken care. Um, and you also can see, you know, they mobilized the entire health system across China to deploy, depatched over 23,000 medical staff with all the equipment um, brought in from other parts of China. So that's the measure, uh, that's the action they took. Uh, can we do that here? Are, are we able or uh, <laughs> should do? That's a question, I think, for the leadership to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, International Institute, we're going to uh, stay with what are some of the lessons we might learn from, from comparing and contrasting to what's going on elsewhere. And I'm going to stay with the China theme for a moment and, um, and um, uh, bring uh, uh, Preeti back up here and with a, with a technical question. So originally, when some of the fatality reports were coming out of China, um, uh, one of our listeners says that fatality rate was 3.4%. Now it seems to have dropped down to 0.4%. What happened with that? Um, so again, changes in fatality rate. Um, uh, any explanations? And then um, a second question I'd ask you to um, uh, uh, address is, any speculation, is this um, infection now going to become endemic that just cycles around, kind of like our, our usual colds and flus? Or um, could this still be um, a one-off spike come down and, uh, and uh, leave our species? So, Preeti? So the, the case fatality rate has been something of, of great interest. And the, remember the early reports from China, these were uh, the patients that presented that were very, very sick. So it wasn't completely a surprise that the rates were high. And in fact, some of the early reports, the average age of patients in Wuhan were was about 50. So you know you, you really missed. It wasn't that there weren't young people infected. It's just that they weren't presenting for care. And, and again, we all saw the photos and and uh, news clips around building hospitals within a few days. And the, the surge for the infrastructure there is really something that is, is unprecedented and really difficult to, to envision and imagine. So uh, by and large, the, the more severe cases were seen. And, and the hope was that this would really be like more of a worst case scenario. Uh, I would contrast that with what was seen in Korea, where they had aggressive testing, uh, very aggressive testing and and actually uh, quarantine and it appears that things have slowed down there and again a lot of the outbreak there was linked to a, a younger group of individuals within a, a religious community uh, but but the case fatality rate looked quite low not as not as low as seasonal flu but you know less than one percent and I think it remains to be seen where where it's going to be and how it's going to be and there's a lot of uh, you know there there are these um, anecdotes of like, you know, healthy 20 year old comes in severe illness and, and uh, requires uh, ICU care. And it, you know, it gets back at, at Howard's point about the reason we care about surge capacity is not just for caring for the you know, frail, medically frail, 
who might present with this, but you know, people still break their leg. They still get appendicitis. They have a whole host of other medical conditions that require care. So I, I think the initial case fatality rate is probably high, which would, which, which would be great. And we'll have to get a lot more data, a lot more denominator data to see where it really is. And, and more than just rates and not just age, but really what are the comorbid conditions that, that, um, that predict a poor outcome? And really, is there some way to modify that? Uh, the, the second question is really sort of the, uh, the million dollar question is, is this um, infection bound to become endemic? Um, like cold or flu, and I would love Howard's thoughts on this, but part of the the uh, aggressive mitigation measures right now is to hopefully prevent some of that. If you can interrupt community transmission, you know, the idea is like if everyone kind of shelters in place um, and, and you flatten the curve and, and this comes through the community, you know, could you could you get it to where this isn't, um, isn't persisting? But there is a, a real concern that it could come back, it could be seasonal, it could become part of our background uh, flora. Now, perhaps eventually we'll have treatments, perhaps we'll have a vaccine uh, for prevention, but I think those are things that are, are really uh, far down the line. So right now we have um, the tried and true uh, public health measures. Thank you, Preeti. Um, and I know uh, uh, Howard uh, hopefully will, will offer his thoughts on that. But also, I'd, I'm going to ask him to speculate on, on two issues. Um, any speculation, you know, on social, the, the social distancing, distancing, how long would that take to flatten the curve? Is there any relationship there? Tough question, but, um, but we'll be uh, interested in your thoughts. And um, any speculation on all of a sudden if a vaccine becomes available, how soon do we go back to normal? How soon will we be able to resume normal activities? Tough ones, Howard. That's why they pay me the big buck. Um, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble separating my hopefulness from my more doctorly or scientific side. So I'm hopeful it does not become an annual thing but there is that possibility. And, and the mere notion that we've had SARS, MERS, and now COVID suggests the latter. And uh, that perhaps if there is a vaccine, that will be part of our annual routine. Uh, we know that you don't have, even if you get infected with COVID, you only have immunity for a few months, uh, about three to four months is what I've read. And uh, so that would suggest like flu that you need to get immunized every year, we're hopeful this is a one-off, but it, it sounds like it, it may not be, and we have to prepare for that. How long would social distancing need to continue to flatten the curve? Well, that's another million-dollar question. We don't know, and that's what will drive our citizens quite mad, uh, literally angry mad, because people don't do well uh, being uh, uh, not de dealing with other people and interacting with other people. And it, we do know that with flu, it had to be for a very long time. The, the cities that did it best did it for a matter of two to four months. And that's a very long time. And that's why President Trump yesterday, I believe, said this may go on till August. I sincerely hope not, but uh, I think that is a possible worst case scenario. And it'd be very difficult to maintain that. It is important to discuss at an international institute setting that different governments and different societies will react to these measures in very different ways. So in a more authoritative government like China, where it is very top down, the citizenry is used to being ordered to do certain things. And I, I was at a conference for SARS, the year after SARS. It was in Atlanta at the CDC, and there was a panel of health officers from uh, Singapore, Beijing, uh, Vietnam, and uh, Toronto, various people who were affected. And the more autocratic and the more authoritative the government was, Singapore had the best record, where you can't even spit out your gum on the sidewalk without uh, 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 getting in trouble. They had the best record of squashing SARS down because of the very strict quarantine measures they used. And the most open democratic society, Canada, Toronto, Canada, 
had the worst. And Americans who are even more open and democratic than almost any other country in the world uh, will have problems adjusting to this. So that's also part of how long with the social distancing is not only how long we as doctors or public health uh, experts would like the social distancing to exist, but how long will the American citizenry, citizen, citizenry tolerate those measures? And that's a real big deal. When would we be able to presume, would we be able to resume activities when a vaccine becomes available or there's another endpoint. You know, it's really funny, when 2009 flu happened and there were surveys of would you like a vaccine, this was when we really thought it was going to be a deadly pandemic. It was a pandemic because it struck almost every country on the globe, but it fortunately was not any more deadly or roughly about as deadly as seasonal flu. Well, early on, when that started in April and May of 2009, everybody raised their hand that they would like a, uh, a, a vaccine. And what was particularly interesting, because it, it seemed to arise in Mexico that year, there were a great many people in the Latinx community who said they would like to go first, okay? Well, what happened nine months later, because it takes about nine to 12 months to make these flu vaccines, particularly then, because they were still literally hatched, and growing in eggs, in chicken eggs, and it takes that much time to grow, develop, and manufacture enough lots of vaccine. Well, what happened? Fewer than 20% of all Americans got vaccinated. And it was particularly low in the Latinx and African American communities. And uh, so, you know, people say they want a vaccine, but they don't necessarily get the vaccine. So I wouldn't look, I, I'm hopeful we will get a vaccine. And uh, Dr. Fauci at NIH feel, feels very positive that we will, but it'll take many months uh, to uh, uh, perfect, manufacture, uh, test, uh, license a vaccine it would probably take nine to 12 months. And it'll be very interesting to see if that curve is flattened and what happens uh, in the people's mindset if they go back to normal. You know, one thing that history teaches us again and again is that the last act of every epidemic and pandemic is global amnesia. So it's like, SARS? What's that? AIDS? Was that a problem? You know, and they'll say the same thing about this. Uh, I hope they'll say the same thing about this. But that global amnesia is what's so dangerous. Because we go back to our normal lives. It's almost like the last paragraph of Camus' The Plague. I highly recommend it. I, I just was teaching it to my students, my undergrads in literature and medicine course. But they go, we all go back on our merry way, and we don't do the necessary planning that we must do for pandemic preparedness. It's not an issue of if, it's an issue of when, as we're learning today. And because we didn't do a lot of planning in the United States, we're getting caught in a bind. And there's a million and one things you have to plan, and even then, you rarely guess the foe correctly. You know, we were planning for influenza for many years, but coronavirus is causing a problem. We thought the next influenza pandemic would arise from somewhere in Asia. It came out of Mexico. But the point is, is that you have to prepare, particularly with ideas about how would you close schools and what you would do with those. How would you take care of universities? What would you do with grocery shopping? On and on and on. With tabletop exercises and planning at every level of government over and over again, you cannot forget this problem. So that's, that's my hope. Great. Thank you, Howard. We're entering into our final 10 minutes, and I'm going to ask each speaker to come up and uh, address a question I have, but then offer any concluding comments or reflections that they might have with a, a definite stop at 530. We also have one of our listeners wondering any intel on what's going on in Russia in terms of how they're observing or responding. So uh, in your closing comments, if anyone has any intel, please uh, offer. The question I'd have, um, if you could address just in, in, in your closing remarks, um, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on what does it mean to wear a mask? Um, what's the science behind masks? Um, we heard, um, you know, there's some people when we're walking out there on the streets, we see a mask. Um, when I'm in the hospital, there are some people who have masks. We're running out of masks. Sometimes the mask can communicate this person's infected. Sometimes it can communicate to us 
that this person is trying to take extra good care of themselves. But there's a lot of mask behavior, and I, I think it's maybe a cultural or international component to it as well. But what's, what's the science? What's your, your opinion on masks and what we should be doing? Um, so many of our stores are sold out of masks. Um, did we miss the boat if uh, we don't have masks and we're not wearing them? Preeti? So, so I would agree that the masks are um, they're very symbolic, and, and there's a huge cultural component. And the um, I, I don't know when the mask wearing started in China, but it, I don't know if it was during SARS. But it's been it's been part of the 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 culture for a while. So I think that that was something. And and we, you know, early on uh, in this epidemic, early in this case is like January. But we had a number of students on particularly like North Campus that were wearing masks and. You know, it created quite a, a little bit of, um, of tension and confusion. So the science, as I understand it, and as, as, as I will share, um, with the masks, these are very important for healthcare workers, uh, particularly the N95 masks in this case, and that is the standard, uh, what we call like personal protective equipment. And uh, many of you have seen the photos of the uh, physicians and nurses and other healthcare providers around the world, and you've heard the stories around shortages because there's actually not an unlimited supply of these, and so many of them are, are made in uh, China and Taiwan, so we're actually having some difficulty obtaining adequate supplies. But uh, the mask does a couple things. One is if you are ill and you go and seek care, we ask you to wear a mask in, in order to prevent um, you spreading, uh, usually through respiratory droplets, uh, to cut back on that. And then th the uh, person who is taking care of you will wear a mask to protect him or herself, uh, the the um, in the United States, uh, in the Surgeon General and the CDC and others, they they have um, spoken on this issue a lot because people have been wearing masks and that um, the feeling is is that you actually could contaminate the mask and you you end up touching your face a lot and uh, they've done these sort of small observational studies where they look at people who are wearing masks and they find that they actually play with their face a lot. And in theory, like if you had some kind of respiratory secretions on that mask from someone else, like you could end up with it in your eye. And so the feeling is, is that it, 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 it doesn't protect and that it might actually increase risk. Um, that said, I, I think that there, this is, this is sort of changing. You know, there are people on airplanes who have been told to put a mask on. And, um, but at this point, the recommendation is still not to, to use them for routine use other than the healthcare setting. Um, and again, I know that varies around the world, and that is a controversial statement because we probably all, f some people feel better. I think about the plague mask from, uh, you know, th uh, the, from a generation, more than a generation, many years ago. 1600. 1600. <laughs> yes, uh, centuries ago. Um, just for closing remarks, you know, I, I am, uh, I'm amazed at how quickly things have changed for, for everyone, and I worry about uh, the focus to the point where we forget about everything else that is important in terms of health and well-being. I feel like all the work in, in every domain of our life has sort of come to a halt, uh, whether it's talking to our kids or talking to our colleagues. I mean, this is like all I think about right now. And uh, I really am looking forward to the day where, you know, I have like a COVID-free day. Um, and I'm, I'm doing my best to also be patient and, and really think about what I can do to to be kind and thoughtful to others, you know. I, obviously, the healthcare workers are one, but there are a lot of other people that are that their life isn't stopping. Whether they're keeping us safe, keeping our environments clean, helping us with schedules, helping people reschedule airline flights. So I think just um, care and compassion and kindness is uh, more important than ever right now. Well, the word on mask is quite controversial. Um, I have a picture of the mayor of San Francisco during the 1918 pandemics, and his mask is wearing, you know, like below. And, and he, he had a mandatory mask law where they were arresting people. The thing about masks is very few people wear them correctly. Uh, we all touch our faces, by the way. In the 50s, a bunch of ENT surgeons did a study where they put uh, dots of ink on your fingertips, and by the end of the day, all, all the 
uh, uh, subjects were blue. Uh, and so if you are touching it and it has respiratory secretions on it, that is an issue. The other thing about a lot of these masks is they're cheaply made and you breathe through little tiny microscopic holes in the weave, whether it's made out of paper or some other material. And so by the end of the day, if you wear it the entire day, you are probably uh, moving out vi viral, viral particles or inhaling them. You need to change them uh, often. And indeed, uh, the, the N95 respirator mask is different because that's real protective gear. Most people have a hard time wearing them, but of course for our healthcare workers, I think they're on the front lines, they're essential. Uh, there was uh, one study done by the National Academy of Medicine when it was still the IOM on face masks, are they good, are they bad? And they really couldn't come up with any data. They did a, made a meta data analysis, they couldn't really do much with it. But uh, two colleagues of ours, uh, Arnold Monto and Allison Aiello, did a study in the dorms a few years ago with flu. And the proper wearing of masks seemed to cut down on the floors that they did do mask wearing and hand washing compared to those that did not. Okay, so that's the mask issue. Uh, overall, I love the comment about compassion uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, Charles Dickens called, called it the true golden gold, love. And if you have a spouse or children, give them a hug. And, and this is far more important. We'll get through this, but give your kids a hug. <laughs> that's what I, I, I really like to do right now. So that's where I'll stop. So the mask, <laughs> uh, I, I agree there's a lot of a cultural difference between Asian and the United States, maybe Western world. So in China, really, uh, start wearing masks is not because of flu, because the pollution. Because uh, there's a s so polluted that people watching the daily pollution, like alert, they put on their mask. So that's become a, a culture to keep them from those um, polluted air. and. Uh, um, so it's kind of a sway in this new uh, coronavirus um, autumn, um, pandemic. So they just pe you know keep the habit of wearing masks. But there's a lot of research circling around. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure this a fault or uh, correct. But uh, there's research that um, talking about the virus can really survive in the airborne. You know for up to four hours, so that kind of make people very nervous, especially the density, um, population density in China is, is, is a much, much more uh, severe than the uh, United States. So people um, shoulder, bump on shoulder to shoulder in the public transportation, the, air, the airport, even uh, in a small uh, grocery neighborhood store. So there's a lot of people contact in those kind of environment and that make people feel safe, they wear masks. So that's the difference that I can tell. Um, and there's an, another question talking, asking uh, from audience say, um, you know, what's the uh, China fever clinic uh, compared to what we are doing at UFM? So in China, they already, uh, because of SARS, they already ramp up with their uh, fever clinic. Um, so any patient with fever symptom, they will defer them to the very specific designate um, clinic to check out. So for this, um, uh, during this pandemic, the, the fever clinic, uh, it's a uh, designate uh, in every hospitals and the patient will be tested very rapidly, identified the positive case, and then they will be uh, mandatory quarantine themselves. And what we are doing here, I, I believe we have a screening hotline. A patient can uh, screening themselves with uh, some questions with our house worker and then they will defer to our um, drive through testing. So that's the difference. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, what a, um, a terrific session. And as we wrap up, again, I want to uh, communicate my thanks to the International Institute for, for bringing this together uh, for this discussion. A special thanks to uh, Dr. Huang, Markel, and Melanie um, uh, about um, uh, the, the information that they brought forward. Um, hopefully, like many of you, you're always trying to look for the silver lining and what's the, um, what's the good news? Um, what can we look forward to? I know uh, for me, there's probably uh, two, um, two takeaways from this discussion as I reflect on our speakers. One is the, the value of civil discourse, how we sit and compare perspectives and notes um, and especially when we're talking about uh, an international topic, there are different views 
that need to be taken into consideration. The second um, takeaway for me that I hope we're all better for because of this is just how can we think about the role of science and evidence? You know, a lot of us have probably thought about some of the, the civil discourse around uh, climate warming, um, are vaccines any good? Um, science and evidence have been under fire, uh, I think, in our society overall. Uh, I think we need to have critical discussion. Science is very real. We're having a very, very real science moment right now. How do we talk about that? And how do we uh, separate that from ideology, opinion, or even some of the cult cultural nuances that come to these discussions? So um, uh, I'm impressed to be part of a community where we're all trying to take care of each other, sometimes through education, sometimes through support. So um, I wish you all good health, uh, good information, and, uh, and uh, thank you for uh, being part of this discussion. And I want to actually also um, include my thanks to all the panelists for really a, an excellent uh, roundtable, um, extremely informative, uh, extremely nuanced, um, very global. And I thought Dr. Kollars did an excellent job of moderating. So thank you very much, Joe, for doing that. Um, I want to tell our audience, and thank you for being here with us, um, that the video will be posted on the II YouTube uh, in just a few days. So if you want a copy of the video, if you want to um, share it with others, if you want to maybe, if you're teachers, you want to use it in your classrooms, please do. We welcome that. And again, thank you to all of our amazing panelists and to all of those who were responsible for helping us put this together, including our co-sponsor, who I neglected in the beginning to, to, um, to uh, thank, and I apologize for that, a Global Reach at Michigan Medicine was also one of our co-sponsors. So thank you to Global Reach. And thank you to everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>